Hello, good morning, and welcome to another episode of Cryptid Ramblers podcast. I'm Callum, and as always, excited to be back again to dive deep into another mysterious monster. Uh, with me again, as always, is my co-host and partner in crime, Scott. Yeah, certainly doing? partner in crime. I'm very good, mate. <laughs> How about yourself? Good. Yeah, not too bad, man. Yeah, not too bad. Glad that uh, this week is coming to an end. But uh, also, we've got ha- had the recording to look forward to, so that's yes. been a, that's been a blessing. Um, Mad I know you've week. had a similar week, haven't you? Yeah. Oh, grief, mate. Grief. Uh, yeah. yeah, work's kind of taken over now that yeah. the Absolutely. COVID lockdown seems to be. Seems to, to be an end, an end in yeah. sight. So, uh, yeah, all the schools yeah. are going mad for it. So that's it. Yeah, working I know we, at the I know schools, getting the them. work done. Well, Silly hours. It. Yeah, long old uh, days, daft hours. I know we do very uh, sort of different jobs. Yours is far more laborious than than mine is in uh, <laughs> you know in, in that sense. But oh, more uh, taxing on the body, mate. Tax on the body. Yeah, and no, I'd certainly get more. <laughs> not oh, well. I don't know if I could say more so, but I you know mine's more on the mental drain and exhaustion so i'm glad and this week's been exactly that um yeah everyone seems to think that you know the lockdown's coming to an end and so it's just uh everyone's everything's just go 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 oh, everyone, everyone wants panicking. everything at the last minute and yeah it's like you've had 15 months to think about your insurance and now you all want it in the space of two weeks oh yeah exactly so, you know they've shortened the programs for for the jobs that i do for all the projects yeah. and uh, yeah they all want it now yeah, exactly. So... <laughs> it's um, yeah, it's just it's madness. It's yeah, it's yeah, but it's it's why we it's why we do it for the love of the job. <laughs> can't, can't be for anything else. <laughs> Speak for yourself, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but it can't be for the money. So it's got to be. There's got to be something there. Maybe I'm just a sucker for punishment. Who knows? <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, before we actually get into it, uh, you know, this week, just wanted to again thank the uh the listeners for sticking with us um as much as we do it for the fun you know sort of for you and i it wouldn't be half as good without the uh without the listeners not only do we obviously we appreciate the the listens and you know some of our pod uh, episodes have been you know really successful so thank you again for that but it's also the interactions that we like receiving um and i understand scott that you've received exactly that from a few regular listeners slash yeah. fans yeah, I have. Yeah, we've got. Um, I've received a message from from Wesley from Wesley Pycroft. He's uh, he's oh, given yeah. us a, a little bit of a a nod to say that he's he enjoyed listening to um, our Valiant Thor episode. Excellent. So, yeah. first off, yeah, brilliant because someone enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which we were worried about, too that sure about. Yeah, exactly. That was a bit of a concern during the research yeah. that one, but. Uh, no, it's um, struck a it, note, isn't it, with a few few people? Yeah, which is which is good actually. We're kind of glad because we were worried about that one. Um, mm. But yeah, he's he's come across and, and he's he's given us a bit of a suggestion that might link in with the government conspiracy around uh, UFOs and aliens. And he said uh, okay. we should look into the Majestic Twelve. And uh, you said yes, you'd, you'd okay. had a yeah. quick wiki at that, and uh, had, yeah. You, it is just from the, the the wiki intro. It is incredibly interesting, and it's certainly something that I think we might end up yeah. doing a bit of a deep dive in later on down the line. I reckon so. I mean, yeah, as you say, I only read probably the opening paragraph of the Wikipedia page, um, and it 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 grabbed my attention straight away. So yeah, yeah. certainly when the the timing is right, I reckon we should uh, we should jump into that. So um, right. yeah, so thanks for and, the suggestion, Wiz. Yeah, yeah, cheers. and uh, I had Justin as well. As uh, he's a regular, yeah. <laughs> a, a regular that's uh, getting involved and telling us what he wants to hear about. Good and man. he wants to hear yeah. more about um, Indrid Cold and, and Lanulos. So yes, yeah, maybe he's saying actually, yeah, that yeah, that's yeah. interesting that we because I know, I know we we discussed this briefly during the week, um, and uh, yeah, Lanulos was something that intrigued the both of us certainly when we were doing the you know the research, doing the reading, listening to you know. Um, Derenberger's book about the mm. you know the visits there and stuff and you know it's, it's one of those you know whilst it was compelling it, it there was so much to it you know you imagine the guys describing the planetary setup you know so yeah. the the what you know the way of life the ecosystem you know the the traditions the religions or, or lack even thereof. like the infrastructure as well the infrastructure was, how they work yeah. you know how they 
you know how they you know sort of uh, come together interact or, you know, with each or, other like, interact yeah get married and it, it was a, it was there was so much info like you could quite easily do a separate episode on just Lanulos alone yeah. which I'm guessing is what Justin's requesting essentially yeah he has you know? yeah I mean, it's um it was really the only reason why we really left all of that out was for time restraints really pretty much just to kind yeah. of we didn't want to be doing like a four hour which it could well have been a four could hour well have been. episode that yeah. one well the big four and, one was originally wasn't it before we had to be yeah. a bit harsh <laughs> so we did it all for your sakes yeah all right just exactly, so you yeah. know we're thinking of yeah. you the listeners <laughs> <laughs> you saved you from us rambling for close to four hours which it yeah, would have, like, which it would have been it, and it was two hours two odd hours anyway if we added in the lanulose stuff then yeah, mm. that could easily have been another hour to an hour and a half easily just discussing it, not even giving our thoughts on it, but just explaining the whole, yeah, the whole kind of yeah. infrastructure. And as he as he says, there are there is more meat on that bone as well. So oh, loads. We yeah, could loads. we could certainly do another episode on Lanulos quite and easily. expand into that. So yeah, quite if easily. that is something that people want to hear, get in touch. Yeah, let, let us know, know yeah. about it. I guess Put it on get, the comments um, and. Instagram, Facebook, even yeah. you know, on the on the YouTube as well. Let us yeah. know, and yeah, we'll we'll quite likely go deeper yeah. into Lanulos. Yeah, because well, as you say, we certainly, you know, we certainly can. Um, and yeah, if we, if we start going into the more, um, you know, kind of UFO space, you know, type cryptids and and creatures and whatnot, then that could sort of tie in, you know, to to Lanulos as uh, you know as a possible. We could even look into you know venus and how they're set up you know living under the surface of the planet obviously where valiant thor was reported to have come from <laughs> yeah, supposedly supposedly Who's alone um <laughs> so um that's where old jc is as well isn't it that's where jc's residing at the moment yep yep <laughs> I, I, I promise i won't have kenny Co- kenny copeland won't come out today i promise no that. no luckily yeah. he's not um He's not involved in this one uh, today, <laughs> but um, yeah, he, he ain't round today. So um... yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah, day off today, thankfully. Um, <laughs> but as uh, as hopefully uh, you know, listeners will uh, remember from the last episode, we wasn't actually sure when we ended it what we were going to be um, covering um, in the in the next uh, mm. pod. However, after not much of a conversation between you and I, we we actually settled on our next cryptid, which. Uh, mm obviously we're covering today um regular listeners won't be surprised to learn that we are in fact back in good old west virginia um <laughs> mountain mama absolutely <laughs> um this time um we are going to the remote town of flatwoods in braxton county um and yeah if you haven't guessed already by the name of the uh the town um then let me tell you <laughs> we are going to be investigating the legend that is the flatwoods monster Blackwoods monster. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, just for a little bit of, uh, you know, a little, little tidbit, a little bit of useless information. Um, as of 2019, the total population of uh, Flatwoods, Braxton County, was uh, a whopping 265 people. Um, That's so nothing at all, is it? absolutely nothing at all. Yeah, I think I've probably got that on the estate that I live on. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, a... we don't even have that in <laughs> villages and hamlets here in England. No, but... <laughs> no, it's, it's, yeah, it's not a lot uh, at all. And just, just for a bit of context, I guess, um, based on previous episodes, um, Flatwoods is roughly two hours southwest of Point Pleasant, which is, uh, of course, where we were researching the fabled uh, Parkersburg man. And yeah, and it's the same distance, but northwest of Parkersburg, um, where we met uh, Mr. Injured Cold um yes so it's uh yeah we're in a, a sort of a pretty close a little triangle of, yeah pretty much of, of where yeah actually yeah no it's yeah triangle of, of sort of those those three sort of locations so yeah they're each with yeah about 100 miles or, or two hours of, of one another so um yeah close proximity so it really is sort of a hive of activity um certainly in this uh in this period um mm. which um yeah which of course is the the 1950s um we're gonna be exploring uh 1952 which is just after the the sort of the ufo summer uh or the washington blip as it's also referred to um which uh yeah which is where actually washington and the you know the, the sort of the government basically noticed um a real hive of activity um i think in the months of july 
um june july and august i think it was which is why it was the, known as the ufo right, summer yeah. um now obviously you know there are a few encounters um with the flatwoods monster that, that we will of course discuss um but as always we'll start with the uh the most famous and what brings yes. us to recording this episode Absolutely. So it, it takes place in the evening of September 12th, 1952. And around about 7.15, Fred and Ed May were playing with playing football in their elementary school's field along with their friend Tommy Hire. Yeah. Um, now, we discussed this when we first looked yeah. at it. I couldn't <laughs> yeah. find a, a, no. a relation to Tommy Hire and um, the Mary reporter Hire. in Point Mary Hire. Mary Hire Point was Pleasant. Point, yeah, is, I was hoping there was a connection, but... We, like, was, we got so excited about that yeah. when we saw it on the wiki. It was like, oh, but no. Synchronicity, but no. No, it just nothing. happens to be Can't the same anything. name. Yeah. Well, it's the same name, but it's spelt slightly differently, which was it, uh, yes. the other giveaway as well. But yeah, unfortunately right. not. <laughs> so um, when we, uh, so they, yeah, they were playing on the elementary school field uh, where they saw a yeah. huge fireball streak, uh, streaking across the sky that seemed to crash in a land owned by uh, a man, G. Bailey Fisher. That's right. Now, brimming with excitement at the prospect of seeing a possible US UFO, uh, they ran back to Fred and Ed's home um, and told their mum that they'd saw an, a UFO shooting across the sky. Mm-hmm. So Mrs. Kathleen May yeah. decided to gather a small team, a small crack team of investigators. <laughs> yeah. In like Stranger to go, Things uh, style wasn't it? That's exactly, yeah. yeah. When Ona Ryder turns up. That's okay. it, yeah. Well, well. well. <laughs> <laughs> Flashlights and backpacks at the ready. <laughs> that's that's exactly it. <laughs> yeah. now, here we go. We found an archetype. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they went uh, to she formed this little team to go and search and yeah. explore for this supposed crashed spacecraft. So that's right. Mrs. May, Fred, Ed, and Tommy set off toward the Bailey Fisher's property, accompanied by three other local lads. That's right. So we've got Neil Nunley, fourteen. Yeah. Ronnie Schaefer. Yeah. Uh, Ten. Yeah. And Eugene Lemon, seventeen. Yeah. Now Eugene is a national guardsman. He um, is, yes. So he was. So he decided that he was going to lead the investigation, lead the search party, armed with his trusty flashlight and yeah. uh, his dog as well. Yeah. So they basically well, there, they jumped a, over. There, the... There's a bit of um, there's a bit of contention around it. Although it's not the, the biggest is, yeah. the biggest point, but I've, I've read a few bits that it was either it was either Eugene's dog. It was either the May family dog or something that I've not heard of, but it was the, the dog was a community dog. Now, whether that just a whether that's just a posh dog. word, yeah, whether that's just a posh saying for it being a stray, I don't know. I didn't really see much in it, so I didn't actually yeah. research its meaning. But I've never heard that term before. Community, community dog, dog was the other thing that, that I've read. <laughs> so whether they just mean it's a stray that everyone just feeds and it's just become kind of a part of the town, I don't know. But well, um well, yeah. Flatwoods so, have got a new mascot, Sonny. Move yeah, on. exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've missed the boat, son. Off, off you pop. See you later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, basically, they they jumped over the fence um, and they scaled yeah. a hill into uh, the Bailey Fisher property uh, to try and locate this crashed craft. Um, as they searched in the dark, panning the flashlight back and forward. Well, that, well, this is worth mentioning. They walked about a quarter of a mile. In order to get, oh, it's there. quite a distance, yeah. yeah distance. So, I just thought this was, it was quite a funny sight. This mum leading all these kids, these six kids, into the woods, into the woods, over the fences and everything dark. in her skirt. Yeah, private land, yeah. <laughs> just, in a typical well kind of mother, you know, housewife fifties get up. I can't imagine it yeah. was probably the best attire for we, climbing. We know fences, a few mums so. around these parts that are like that. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. It's, yeah. I, just, so, I mean, that's it's not uncommon. Thing, isn't it? It's it's not. No, but it's just. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, I can imagine what my mum would have said. But could you imagine what your mum would have said if you'd run home at, at seven o'clock at night, saying, like, "Mum, mum, just seen a meteor or just seen a spacecraft crash." I, know exactly I can imagine what the response. Would have said and it would be and it wouldn't unintelligible. Have been, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, couldn't repeat it on a podcast. That's for sure. Um, yes. <laughs> and, and yeah, I just can't imagine she would have gone like, right, let's, you know, grab your cousin, you know, let's grab your flashlights and let's go and have a look at it. Let's grab some of the neighbours, boys, as well. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's grab, grab some other impressionable yeah. youths. Let's, and, uh, let's not call the police or anything like that. Let's, let's not, not call yeah. the, let's not, not actually call the National Guard. Let's just get one of the lads from we'll just the Just get National one of Guard. them and bring them, bring them along, eh? Yeah. Eugene, 
Go on, Sunshine. Yeah. So we'll go, go UFO spotting and we'll also press <laughs> pass on private property, which is also yeah. a great lesson. So, yeah, yeah let's, let's do go. It, people. <laughs> yes, it, yeah. Tristan's so, bad, huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, it <laughs> certainly is. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so as I was searching in the dark, panning the uh, flashlight back and forth, the party spotted two shining uh, red eyes in a tree. And at first, they just thought it was like an opossum or a raccoon, which are, yeah. you know, little critters. They're quite rife in that area. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, Eugene uh, turned the flashlight toward the shining eyes, and the light fell upon a monster that stood at 10 feet tall with a large, round, glowing eyes. A red circular face um, backed by the head was a shape of a large ace of spades. Now, his body was slight and tapered into what appeared to be drape-like folds, and the whole creature hovered above the ground, so it Mm. didn't seem to have any legs. No. The monster hissed Mm. and flew toward them with terrible claws outstretched. Eugene stumbled back, terrified, dropped the flashlight, and they all ran for the hills. Now, Lemon and Mrs. May reported the incident to the authorities, and they later appeared on a TV show in New York, Mm. uh, We the People, and this was several nights later. Yeah, Um, I think it it was as soon as the following day, um, because one of the interesting points is that Kathleen May not only called the um local sheriff's department to report like to call it in um but either before or after that interaction she then took it you know straight to the press that's and, right, that's, yeah. and that's been another sort of bone of contention with um not so much locals because it seems like braxton county are pretty much invested in this story as being as being true but certainly any yeah. skeptics from the outside are sort of thinking well you know if, if this really happened and you're you know you're in that situation you're spooked and everything else you know, why would you go to the press with it first? Surely you'd go to the right authorities, you know, you'd you'd ensure that your kids were safe and well, you know, I think everything it's worth, else. I think it might be worth mentioning the press in the nineteen fifties is very different to the press of today. You know, oh, yeah, the, the press of yeah. today are very much like they don't they, they they don't care if they're correct. They just want to make sure that they're they first. didn't no, they didn't care for uh evidence or you know for but back with, then, witness statements was more, or anything like that. It was well, I think back then, if you had a journalist, you had journalists that were actually out there seeking for the truth. And yeah. to a certain degree, there was this sensationalism of the UFO flaps, especially in that area and at that mm. time. But well, of course, it yeah. was it was something that was in the press quite a lot. And there was mm. people that weren't necessarily being called crackpots straight off the bat. So yeah. they were just coming out with it. So, yeah, I saw this. And, and it was they being treated as gospel away. unless debunked or proven otherwise. It was being mm. treated as gospel and people were seemingly believed a lot easier than, you know, what, what it is now. I mean, if this story or this encounter was to happen, you know, now, you know, especially with the technology and the, the special effects and everything else, it would, everyone would be jumping on the fact that, you know, that, that it was a fake or that they would, they would try to debunk it before yeah. trying to take it for what it is. Whereas, yeah, as you say back then, it, it was a lot more, I guess it was more of an innocence with it, you know, and, and if someone came forward with something that would be seen not... as quite crackpot, you'd be like, well, why would you come to me if this wasn't true? Because people yeah. are going to think that you're nuts. So There's, there was a lot more trust. Yeah. Well, and this then, was only like between well, individuals and between societies as well. Well, exactly. And, and I think, you know, as you say, you know, journalists wanted the scoop, you know, they were in it to make a name for themselves as journalists, not just to report big news. So they wanted to be first. They wanted to kind of set the precedent and, you know, launch these stories. And, and it was only what, five years after Roswell. So, UFOs yeah. were still very much at the forefront of pop culture, or ser- seemingly just coming into pop culture. Certainly in the um, you know the United States. I mean, I mean, like we referenced in the Valiant Thor episode, um, the sci-fi film, the day the Earth stood still, yeah, came out almost exactly a year prior to this um, to this encounter. I mean, this encounter was what September twelfth, fifty-two. Right. The day the Earth stood still came out on the eighteenth of September fifty one. Oh, there you go. So you're almost talking a year, a year after, seemingly one of the first kind of real popular sci fi films. Yeah. Um, you know, sort of came out. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's worth. Um, I don't know if it, you know, sort of adds any weight to the story, but I, I remember reading as as they as the group were approaching the hill or the the top of the ridge, they saw that it was kind of enveloped in like a mist 
or like a, yes. a smoke um, yeah, that was sort of this... rolling over the, the hill as they approached the, mm. the top of the ridge. And as they got sort of closer, obviously it got denser when they, you know, sort of started to look down into the, you know, sort of the bottom of the, the ridge. And like with many of these encounters that we've certainly gone over, whether it be, you know, Bigfoot, Mothman, it came with it quite a pungent smell, which was yes. which has been described as again as as sulfur, sulfur. Which anyone who listens to the Bigfoot episode and the Men in Black episode will obviously well recognize. I found that reference. out. I found out um, through. I didn't make a note of it. I, I, I'll try and get a note of it. But I found um, a geological website that said that there is a lot of. Um, well, I suppose they call them sulfur springs in that area. In the in that part of the Appalachian yeah, Mountains, so there is um, there is natural sulfur being emitted into the atmosphere from that area. There is. They cover that on. I mean, I'll come onto it more specifically, I guess, later on. But in a Monster Quest um, episode, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> good I old Monster, Monster Quest, Quest. <laughs> um, and they cover. Although I think the episodes refer to as the Lizard Man, they actually cover mm. the Flatwoods Monster, and it's basically they're trying to debunk it, basically. They, they believe it's nonsense from the get-go. Um, and they comment on that because they say that there are a lot of underground cave systems and stuff in yes. the Appalachia um, mountains and stuff. So they said that the fact that you're smelling, you know, sulfur and that there could be kind of, you know, steam pools or stuff in certain boggy areas isn't that unusual compared to where mm. compared to where they are. But so well, I, that, I was, the that was actually name. something that another listener spoke to me about. And said about the, yeah. the various different cave systems that are in that area, and that was uh, Sam Mott. Yeah, Sam, Sam Mott. Mott. He he got in touch with me and and said, like, dude, you know, like all these weird happening that's mm. going around in West Virginia. Yeah, have you just have you thought about maybe looking at the cave systems? And yeah, we spoke about the cave systems um, briefly, we and there's some the weird yeah. phenomena that happens with regards to caves. So weird yeah. uh, phenomena with into... time that as well because so, that could certainly add to a lot of what we've looked at in and around um west virginia there's a very good film actually that's on amazon i forget what it's called but it explores the idea of time jumps within caves that time moves differently when you go into cave oh, systems right. and such um and it's okay. it, it's a little bit fantastical it's yeah. good viewing yeah, yeah but course, it's yeah. it good because it, it explores that theory mm. of time moving differently underground yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, the, it, with the Appalachian Mountains, it does obviously it goes right the way through that area, um, and the Mammoth Cave System that is the biggest cave system in the world, if I'm if I'm correct. Yeah. And there's so much that still hasn't. I believe there's so much that they still haven't mapped. They haven't mapped um, all of it. No. Yeah, it's but already it's, the largest or something. Yeah. It's it's so incredibly it's vast. So I mean, that's even he did also mention about Helia. He said, have a look at Helia yeah, and the yeah. goblins that come up. <laughs> the Kentucky so, goblins. <laughs> <laughs> Kentucky goblins. So, which he said that could be a connection there. So, I'll have to watch you it. Know, I'll have to. You haven't I'll, seen it. I've, I haven't. I've I haven't. seen both seasons. See, but it um, was a while ago. You know, our our, uh, our good friends over at um, Not Another Conspiracy uh, podcast. They did an episode on they it. They did an episode on it, which was really good. Um, and, you know, and I listened to it um, having not watched the series at, at that point. Um, cause I got as far as the first episode and, and just thought this is yeah. absolute nonsense. <laughs> Drop me out, mate. Which is quite a lot <laughs> considering what, you know, we've been going over in our recent, you know, episodes. <laughs> I know, right. Yeah. But I just, there was just something about it. That I just it very rich there, Callum. It was very rich. I know. It, I know, right. <laughs> it was, uh, Joey, you know the, the, you know the couple reminded me of, um, Derek Akora and that other bird on, um, most haunted. Oh, Effect Fielding. Called. Effect, yeah. Where you just know that they're. They know that they're full of shit, but they're trying to convince you otherwise. That's kind of the impression I got from the couple doing Hellier, that they knew yeah. that it was nonsense, but they were trying to just fill, fill their time with something. It was like a pleasure mm. project for them. Do you know what I mean, I'm maybe not giving them enough credit. I only gave it one well, episode. I, I, do but... remember, I do remember watching Greg Newkirk's first show that he did like years ago when it was yeah. on Living TV. When that wow, existed. living. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I remember that because yeah. I went through a phase of watching most most haunted all the time. I was like, yeah. I was an avid. Oh, we all, yeah, we all watched it. Was it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, it was incredibly yeah. entertaining. Absolutely. But I watched his one, and uh, 
it, he because he references that show mm. in Helia, and it was something that he hasn't looked at for years and years. And yeah, years. No, exactly. I do remember. I remember it, and like they would turn up to ghost hunts with weapons and stuff. Like yeah, this. I know it's, um, <laughs> it was it's incredible, but um, I really enjoyed Helia. Yeah, so we oh, we'll definitely give it a we'll definitely give it we'll a definitely go. Definitely give it a, but, um, a go. But no, the 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 point I was going to make with the with the geologist um, on the, the Monster Quest episode, obviously where he mentioned the underground cave systems and the fact that sulfur could you know sort of come up through those, is that a geologist did do a. He did he got like a um a land map to kind of see where Flatwoods sat in relation to some of these underground systems. Um and apparently the closest one would was quite a few miles away from where the encounter happened. So he said, although in theory that something like that could happen, mm. he said the gases would have to sort of travel quite a, a distance to come up at the point of where the encounter was, because it was at yeah. the top of quite a sizable hill. So he said it'd have to be quite a sizable cave underneath to project it, you know, sort of through the, the land. So he said, although the theory works in essence for that area, he said it doesn't necessarily 100% confirm that that's what it was that happened on that gotcha. night, just because of the geology of it and, the, you know, the, the, the placements and stuff. But I, th- I thought that was really um, interesting. It's worth mentioning, definitely. Well, yeah. the, the, um, it, the, the main reason as well for mentioning it was because the, the dog that you mentioned at the, the start, um, whether it was Eugene's or the, the May families or whatever, um, reportedly ran off down the ridge line into the smoke when they saw the the monster. They heard the dog kind of howling quite loudly, and then it ran back up the ridge line towards them, almost like with its tail between its its legs whimpering, and supposedly mm. ran back on its own past the group to you know to the town. Um, that's when. Eugene, I believe, shines the the flashlight sort of in that general area, and he notices the the creature. I think it jumps or it, it kind of levitates down from the tree branch, yeah, down to just below the the floor. So it's still kind of in the cover of the tree, but it, it's just it's hovering, you know, sort of above the floor. And yeah, that's when they, they shine the, the the torch on it. Obviously, he's the first one to look at it and think that's not right, and he. Basically, and then it, he, it, he drops a lung it, and and panics and <laughs> <drops a lung. laughs> and he he bolts basically back down the the ridge you know to the the uh, boundary line of the you know of the farmland and everyone mm. else eventually sees it as well and and kind of follows suit. But yeah, as you say, at this point, it's kind of looking like it's making an aggressive approach, you know, kind of yeah. um, you know, kind of towards well, them. So it, it it does seem that there's um, a few different versions based on uh, which one and obviously they're all apart from mrs may who is mm. technically the only adult there really yeah. they're all kids and obviously yeah. there, there's a lot of um kids tend to, to fill the gaps and, and stuff and make things a little bit bigger exaggerations and such yeah so for, for me i was mostly taking kathleen may's account on this one but yeah how how reliable is she on that? She took six kids into the woods looking for a UFO. Yeah. <laughs> just like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> trespassing yeah, exactly. and everything. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not shitting on it. Definitely not. But it's, yeah, how I thought, right, okay, yeah. take, I'll take the adult version of, of, of this all. And it's um, if you do ever um, search up the Flatwoods monster, you will see the image of her and Eugene Lemon standing there next to a sketch of what they saw. That's right. It was for the was... purposes of the TV show, isn't it? The a local artist that right. um, almost like when they do like a e fit or something. Someone had been drafted in to basically do a, a sketch of what it was they claimed to have seen. Mm. They also drew a, a a sort of a, a human next to it. Yeah, so for you kind could of see the it scale. For scale. Yeah, so you could see how sort of big it was. And yeah, is... that picture was from a, the TV appearance they did the following. The following day, wasn't it? I believe that's right. Yeah, which is really quite interesting as well, to because it's you don't ever hear of that sort of thing happening now either. No, because no one wants to give it any weight, no one wants to give it any time or anything like that. I mean, it looks no. incredible, just the image it looks, itself. And, it looks amazing. It does. It's, I mean, yeah. even if that is, even if that is from someone's imagination, what an imagination because it's such a you know, it's such a vivid, you know, and like I say, things like Roswell and 
you know, data sort of still that kind of thing. It was still in, in its infancy in the scheme of things. It's only Roswell was only five years before, so I don't think there would have been enough material for them to have kind of looked at it all and yeah. thought, and, and you know, for it to influence their mind to then come up with something, you know, well, like that. It's, I mean, if you take, for instance, all that the like the the old school films and stuff that people were doing they were the the, the mm. imaginations that the film writers and costume designers were having it was all very much humanoid things so they mm. they had legs the fact that this is depicted as levitating yeah with what well, looks like a skirt sort of thing like a metallic skirt like a, yeah i mean others have sort of because the the two may brothers i think even to this day um believe that it was me- mechanical so what they're saying is that the bottom half of the creature um we'll, we'll share a, a picture uh, of what we're talking about on mm. the uh, on the socials um but it's basically like the the bottom end of a rocket so if you yeah. if you imagine where it kind of funnels it funnels out from the middle um and, it, and it's the sort of the bulbous bottom part of a rocket that's essentially the bottom half of the creature um and then the the top half is they believe is like a uh, sort of a humanoid lizard um, type. Mm. But obviously, when the May family and uh, and their friends saw the the creature, it was in its full uh, get up um, with the you know the, the it was in its battle collar gear, like, and the helmet and well, yeah, because they yeah, because when they say they see the um, the eyes shining, they note that it wasn't the eyes weren't shining the light as though it was like the headlights of a car. It was as though the helmet was lit up from the inside so mm. they could see its red eyes. And then the light was coming out from, you know, sort of within the helmet. Or, like emanating so, from so, the helmet. But yeah, exactly. the eyes were so, glowing. But the eyes were glowing, yeah, because obviously that was the part that would emit light because everything else was kind of solid or or, or covered up. Um, but uh, large yeah, glowing it, orange eyes. There's... Yeah, I mean, it's... it's that, I mean, interestingly, that's one of a few things that the May brothers have actually debunked themselves because it, it seems like this is one of the the sort of the legends that has kind of had things added onto the story as the years of you know as the years have passed almost like a you know a long game of Chinese whispers you know the the you know you had the, oh, initial, yeah, the story gets you had the initial and story changes. and then yeah the, the the more kind of people it passes through or the more generations that hear it the more that you know stuff gets um you know, stuff gets added on. Like, for example, um, the dog um, was reported yeah. to have ran past the group after seeing the the creature and being within the the smoke. Ran to the back to the town, uh, and when the May family returned, they found it dead on someone's porch in a in a pool of its own vomit. Mm. Um, now, if you watch the Flatwoods documentary on Amazon, they actually interview the two May brothers, um, Ed and Fred. And they actually, I can't remember which one it is that, that says it, which one of the brothers, but one of them basically says, no, that, that didn't happen. Like The dog was fine. It, yeah, it there was a, they also debunked sick. the the other biggest story is that the the search party, the seven of them, mm. went after they left and got really sick. You know, that their yeah, eyes, that was... uh, some people were saying that their eyes were burning, which was something that we'd um, found with the Mothman episode. Yes. It was... Um, uh, young Connie, she had mm. issues with her eyes because was it. she looked upon Mothman mm. and it had affected her eyes somehow. Something which is from also, its eyes. Yeah. Well, yeah, which is something that is also um, conducive of close-up UFO sightings. So yeah. it's almost something to do with the radiation creates conjunctivitis. Yeah. Um, I think, um, I think, like what we were saying, I think that's where someone has heard other encounters or as the years have gone on, other encounters have happened. And then people have tried to find similarities to kind yeah. of link to the Flatwoods encounter to almost give that more credibility because they have created dots may... to, to, to match, haven't they? Exactly. Yeah. They... Dots to link up. And, yeah, and everything, exactly. Which... But the May brothers in... debunked that themselves. They said that mm. aside from being a bit shaken up, um, you know, and obviously a bit frightened from what had happened, he said, for the most part, everyone, you know, everyone was actually, um, actually okay. I mean, it's, I mean, just kind of tacking on to that a little bit. Kathleen May sadly passed away, I think, in two thousand and nine um, mm. from cancer, uh, and it's reported that both the May brothers also have um, cancer. And I think people were trying to sort of say that they've all contracted cancer from the 
encounter from exposure to flat this monster. So yeah, sort of the thing. exposure yeah. to the radiation, the the sulfur inhalation, or the you know the smoke on the ground. They interestingly, if it was at the time of recording the documentary, um, they didn't um, they didn't mention it. So whether it was something that happened in in later life after the documentary, I don't know. I can't really find much of a timeline to you know add any real um, real sort of credence to it. Um, but the other thing that they debunk, which I thought was quite interesting, um, was the actual green eyes, the the, the flashing green eyes. The, the it's different, I think, to yeah. what Eugene claimed. But the two May brothers said that it didn't have glowing eyes; they could just see the light. It was it was essentially just as though it was lighting up the helmet from the inside. Mm. That's what they described it as because they they're adamant that it was whatever it was was mechanical and it was like a a scout vessel that was sent sent down to to flatwoods have a little bit of look um, around then have a bit yeah. of a look around or whatever and obviously the helmet was lit up so it could see out of you know out you know from its you know casing or helmet or whatever it was to yeah to investigate and to explore and whatever else so that that's another thing that's kind of debunked and i, I don't know i think either they want to keep it true to their story because they you know came up with it and they don't want anyone else kind of tacking on their ideas but no i, I think it, um yeah i think it does add a bit of credence that they were so open in debunking almost their own story by kind of saying well no what we this is what happened mm. all these other bits you've heard aren't true like we don't it's, you know we we like they're reining it back in isn't it because the, yeah, it's, the it's not just it's not just them that saw it there were some other encounters and i believe you there were. actually looked into them because you had the time to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I mean, that, yeah, I suppose that, uh, yeah, I suppose that that did help. Um, yeah, so there, there's two others that I that I came across. Um, one I think is actually my favourite encounter of all of them, um, which I'll which I'll go on to. But the first one, um, which which again I think is quite interesting, it, it occurred not long before the main incident on September 12th. Um, now, I, I've done a fair bit of research on this and i couldn't find an actual timestamp for when it happened I, I believe it was weeks before the initial encounter but i haven't got well, a date I, on it but after after we spoke about it earlier in the week i did actually i found um i found a a, a couple of youtube videos that said it was almost like a day after it was like within within well, 24 the... hours afterward well, that's the, the this, you're talking about the Harper one. Aren't I'm you? talking about the Harper one. Yeah. So yeah. That, so this, this, the, they the said Sitowski that Harper one. was a couple of couple of hours or within 24 hours of the right, um, okay the the May. Let's call it the May encounter. The May encounter. Yeah. Um. Then, okay. yeah, and then the then the Snatowski one was a couple the day after. days after. Yeah. It's but this is just it. It's, it's kind of difficult to find exactly these specific details. Because mm. I think so many people have taken this story, like what you're saying, taken the story and made it bigger and yeah. tried to connect dots that don't exist. Exactly. And, and they've muddied and the water. And it's convolu convoluted the yeah. whole, yeah, it's muddied the water. Yeah. And it's made, it's made finding these things mm. so much more difficult. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, but yeah, as you, as you alluded to, um, this, this one involves a uh, Mrs. Audrey Harper, uh, who claims to have seen the monster. Interestingly, it wasn't within the town of Flatwoods. Um, it was actually five miles north of Flatwoods in um, a little town called Heaters. Um, now, her and her friend were walking through some you know, local farmland. Um, they're using it as a shortcut to get to their local grocery store because their normal route had been made unusable. So I'm guessing through weather conditions or, or something like that they mm. don't really go into why they couldn't go that way but this was a shortcut that would get them there in like half the time um so about half a mile into the the trip um audrey notices a ball of fire up on a hill um that they were passing um much like what the the may brothers first saw on you know mm. in their encounter um at first audrey dismissed it as uh, just a, a neighbor um Fox chasing, um, which uh, oh, okay. which I guess is, 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 is sort of like the old school um, fox hunting that they do, that they still unfortunately do now, yeah. but now they well, use noises to draw them out. Can't really call it hunting. 
It's not, really, it's not really hunting, no. no. As such, get a load of dogs, jump on a horse, and off you go. Tally yeah, exactly. Tally how, oh boy. However, yeah, she, she used to sort of passed it off as just, you know, normal kind of farmland behaviour for that sort of time. Um, the fireball at this point vanished, um, and instead in its place stood a tall, dark silhouette of a man-shaped figure. Um, now, obviously completely terrified, both Audrey and her friend just make a run for it. Um, and they run through the remaining of the, the, the remainder of the field until they approach a um, a gap in in the fence. Now, as they like Audrey walks through first, her, her friend follows just behind, and as she turns back instinctively to kind of see if whatever it was was there, the creature is standing like re- right in front of her, like not not quite nose to nose, but probably reaching distance. Yeah. Um, it doesn't kind of do anything or or make a noise or anything it just stands there as though it was kind of following them to you know see where they went um the friend screamed and they just both ran as fast as their body could take them yeah um until they presumably got to the store or the the edge of the the farmland um never you know never saw it again um but the interesting thing for me was that like I say, this is this is reported to have happened before the May incident. Um, it could have been days. I've read it that it could have been weeks before. But the, the thing that I found interesting was the fact that it's the ball of fire, which is quite a specific thing to take mm. sort of from it, that they'd seen the same thing, this ball of fire kind of hovering, you know, crashing in sort of woodland, and then out from that, you know, appears this this sort of creature. Now, Audrey didn't seem to go too much into the description of what she saw, aside from the fact that it was, a, a, you know, a, a sort of a, a man-shaped figure, and it was a tall, dark silhouette. There was no mention of the the kind of the um, no colours, like, Ace like of that, Spades or... kind of like helmet, or you know, the fact that it was gliding or or anything like that. It was a very kind of um, kind of vague encounter, I guess, or, or description of the encounter. So whether that adds any credence, because I think sometimes when well... they add too much into it. Yeah, you start to you start to you know you start I, to I start question to their you start to question their their um their ability to react because quite mm. frankly if two young young women are walking through the woods and there's a silhouette of a tall man yeah don't stick around to take down the details just get out of there exactly and that's that's why I think it adds a lot of weight because they've kind of she's looked up she's thought sod that she screamed huh? and she's bolted yeah <laughs> so the, so from the most that so once she's calmed down and through the fear and for everything else the confusion whatever mm. she's been able to say what well, you know it was tall dark silhouette it chased us it, you know there was a ball of fire beforehand i don't know i ran what, like what do you want from me you want a bloody picture or you want you know yeah so that's what i think you know when you read these encounters where they can tell you the the bloody height, the, the, you know, the skin tone, the detail in facial features, what it was wearing, you know, and kind of all this stuff. That's when I start to think, well, how, why would you, how could you know so much? Cause surely you'd be yeah. petrified. Well, there's, there's not many people out there. that have got photographic memories and I don't know, maybe there, there is, there is um, a psychological aspect to trauma in that you do take in those details almost like it, it goes into mm. slow-mo, but could yeah it could be that as well it could, it could be, be that. that i mean I'm... i've not had an encounter myself to kind of know how i've recalled something or how i've you know so i wouldn't know how i would you know react um mm. I'd, so yes it's, it's hard to say but i think just for my own personal beliefs i guess if if something's almost a little bit more vague i'm you know i'm a little bit more likely to believe it because of the situation because of the you know, scenario, you know, like when you go in, you know, when you read Strange's encounter with Alan Thor, it's almost like mm. he's got, he went to the point where he just, he said too much. He didn't know when to shut up and he ended up talking himself into. He kept digging that hole, the, didn't he? Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of almost what I find some people can, you know, do, which is why I think they do get called out for being, you know, for either lying or for hoaxing the, you know, the whole situation. Mm. But no, I, I thought that was, I think as well, because it was, it was two, two young girls and you don't find many of these encounters really involving women or certainly young women of that era because of again the nature of the encounter the fact that they were on their own it was you know it was dark they were in, in farmland woodland or whatever so i just think with all the all the sort of the criteria points i think kind of hit a few well and it's close proximity me, geographically as well 
you well, know, it was only five, it was only miles, five out, miles so. within the, yeah. the the May encounter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're talking like what an hour, an hour away from Flatwoods, maybe something like that. Yeah, probably so, not even that really. Well, yeah. I guess walk really. It's only Walking, five miles. Yeah. So and also the other yeah. the other encounter that you really liked was again really very very one. close, very very close proximity to. Um, to Flatwoods as it well. It was. It was not as close. A little bit. A little bit further out. But and and from my research, I've got this as occurring on the thirteenth of September, so the day after the main encounter. Mm. Um, and it involved uh, George and Edith Snatowski and their eighteen-month-old baby. Um, they were travelling from New York to Ohio. Um, now I don't know. The, I, I couldn't really find anything on the purpose of their journey, but. I, most part did you find the location of it? I have. Did you yeah. manage to find? Yeah. yeah, Strange Creek. Strange Creek. Yeah, which is just like, like fucking. Yeah, you know, yeah. Alarm bells. Alarm, <laughs> yeah, alarm bells going off. Don't drive yeah. through Strange Creek, people. Exactly. It's, yeah. You know. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. So having a bit of um, time on their hands, George decides to take the scenic route, which, as you say, uh, took them through Strange Creek, um, which I believe is about twenty miles south of Flatwoods. Um, mm-hmm. Now, they were driving down a, um, a rural road, uh, Route 4, uh, apparently I think it's called, um, when their car just suddenly dies, just claps out, engine turns off, they come to a halt. Um, George tried to restart the car, but with, with, with no luck. Um, at, at this point, um, they both start to notice, again, a foul, sulfurous smell filling the air you know, within the, within the vehicle. George gets out to inspect the engine um, and notices a bright light coming from the field to the side of him. So it's, you know, to, to the side of the road. Um, yeah. He then begins to hunch over, grabbing his chest and um, begins to sort of cough and uh, vomit. Um, this lasts for reportedly, you know, sort of a couple of minutes. Um, as he stands to, you know, sort mm. of straighten himself up, Edith from within the car begins to, scream like blood curdling scream you know leaves leaves her her mouth um and he she because she's basically noticed something behind george now when he stands he, he turns around away from the car and he's confronted by the monster which basically matches the description from the main encounter for you know for the most part um except this time the monster isn't wearing what was presumed to be like the hood or the helmet, which took on that um, Ace of Spades uh, shape. Yeah, the Ace of Spades. Yeah. Um, it, it's missing that. It hasn't got that. But the bottom half is exactly the same. The top half is more exposed. And this, this is where he um, describes it as a... Uh, I think he says it, he not, noticed, noticed its head, um, which had a bony reptilian look to it. Um, he... Of, uh, uh, yeah, and it was standing at roughly 10 feet tall. So again, the size was, you know, was roughly the same. But again, it's hovering off the floor. So, you know, you oh. don't know, like with the main counter, if it's hovering above the floor, it might mm. only have been, a, you know, I don't know, six feet tall. But because it was hovering, it made it made well, it look or take on a greater, Nick, If I could hover off the floor, may I be the same height as you? Yeah, so. well, you can, you can live in hope, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day. <laughs> <laughs> Where one can dream. One, one can, can dream. dream. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so George obviously panics. His wife Edith still screaming from the inside of the car. The baby's now crying at this point. He makes his way back round to the side of the vehicle and and gets in. You know, locks the door on his side. He um, he instructs um, Edith and the baby to basically lay in the uh, footwell of the car. Um, in the in the back uh, like between the back seats and the the front seats mm. uh, so they do that and then he basically lays himself down um so he's kind of below the um frame of the door so you know to, trying to sort of hide so he's shrinking himself into the into the footwell um he then sort of claims to, to see the monster basically drag its hand across the the car bonnet um circles the vehicle a number of times um, before then disappearing into the, the darkness and you know presumably the the field to the to the side now the the really creepy thing what i thought is that as soon as it left the car restarted 
you know, of, it, of its own accord. And, you know, they were then able to speed away and, and sort of carry on their, their journey. Um, get the hell out of there. Get the hell out of Strange Creek. Um, <laughs> no, <exactly. laughs> just, 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 yeah. Sorry, to say that again about the Strange Creek. It's like something out of a scary movie. It is, the two doors, it? the scary way, safe way. <gasps> yeah. Go and scare the scary way. It's just yeah. like... It's almost like don't in, go through um, Strange Creek, people. Please. It, it reminded me of, um, yeah, of kind of like yeah, like you said, like the scary movie films, but also like the. Have you seen? Uh, I think it's It Two, or It, it Chapter Two. <laughs> yeah, where they're the standing in front doors. of the three doors, and it says like not scary, scary, and very scary. It's yeah. like he came to a fork in the road, and he was like, "Well, let's, we can go to, we can go down Pleasant Avenue, or we can go to Strange Creek." Let's go to Strange Creek. Let's, let's take my <laughs> let's take my young family through Strange yeah, yeah. Creek. Let's take the scenic route, shall we? I hope nothing <laughs> weird happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you couldn't. I, mean, I was going to say you couldn't make it up, but it's quite you possible could, you could. Possibly, it's, quite, it's possible. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's interesting to note that uh, George Snatowski didn't actually give this account until 1955. So, you know, you're looking oh, at a good two to three years again. later. So, possibly. I mean, again, you know, I don't know. I couldn't find anything on George or Edith, you know, in terms of like um, character references and stuff. So I don't know what type of guy he was. But, you know, if, if you're, you know, if you're if you thinking back of, of that time, you know, what Woody Derenberger was like, he could have been, mm. you know, just a, a simple guy. I don't mean simple as in stupid, but, you know, just a, you know, typical, simple normal, man. just kind of middle class, simple guy, you know, went about yeah. his business, didn't bother anyone. And that having the sort, this the encounter... Sort of man and, Leonard Skinner would sing about. Yeah, exactly. You know, an old <laughs> yeah, simple exactly. man. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, and so he could have just thought, well, you know, me coming out with this, I'm just going to get mocked. I'm going to get ridiculed. Mm. I'm just going to keep it between us. You know, we, we were petrified. We don't want anyone to know about it and whatever. And then maybe the maze came out and... I don't want people knowing I'll drove through Strange Creek. Uh, yeah, I don't even think I was, I'm a dickhead and I drove down Strange Creek and something <laughs> happened and I'm surprised about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did uh, something yeah, I stupid thought... and I won a stupid prize. You yeah. Know, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Exactly. Um, and so, yeah, so I was... I mean, that, that, that for me, I think is the most... Is, that's my favourite. And I, I don't know why. I think it's just the creepiness of it. I think the fact that he, you know... It does he, sound like he a came, horror movie, doesn't it? It does. You know, I mean, and I think, obviously, being a you know horror movie buff as well, I think that's maybe what's kind of, you know, struck yeah. me a little bit. And, and, you know, obviously being an aspiring author as well. Like, you know, all those things just... I've, I've invested in that story for that reason. I've just thought this would be an awesome kind of it you does know, short story or something, you know, if you you know, if you used to go down that route, but no, but the fact that there was like the physical encounter from the, the, the dragging of its hand across the bonnet, which is, you know, to me is quite an aggressive, you know, gesture to kind of it make, isn't it? You know, it or be. it could I have mean, just he, been he, feeling the metal to think, Oh, that's like my, that's like well, my it, suit or, you know, well, it's, it's a, to, to, to expand on that is exactly what great white sharks do to the cage in the water. Mm. Now to us, fucking terrifying because you've yeah. got like a, a 15 foot great white with its gaping mouth coming at you all it's doing is trying to figure out what this what thing is in is. the water yeah. and it's just touching yeah. it it's yeah. it's not attacking it it's just touching it mm. but to us fucking terrifying yeah. like yeah, why exactly. would you get yeah. out of there what are you doing and it could exactly it could have been the same because with the other encounters there haven't been any sort of physical elements to it but they've also just been people in the middle of the woods so there's been nothing i mean aside from maybe looking people up and down maybe body scanning them or whatever there mm. wasn't anything else for them to really you know kind of examine whereas this was the first one where there was actually a, a mechanical object that it had maybe never seen and so maybe that's why it was touching it for the sensory mm. kind of thing because well, as we know cut- it go on. yeah cars cutting out is a regular thing with ufo is, encounters yeah. as well is, yeah either with contactees or yeah. abductees the surge in in the sort of the energy or even of, just the stuff. regular sightings being right. chased by ufos in their cars yeah. and the cars just cutting out well, the headlights so, cut out or the engine cuts or yeah so it's definitely a one of the tropes of you know sort of ufo sightings or or encounters but i think that yeah you, you could be right with that i guess because it, it didn't have its its reported get up on it was more exposed so you know touching the bonnet was was it more of a sensory thing was it trying to figure out what the car was did it mean any harm you know what maybe figure out what its purpose was 
you know, you know, and as you say, using the the shark um, reference, you know, did they see that as an aggressive, you know, an aggressive approach? You know, and I think for any human, I guess, in that situation, I think you absolutely would, wouldn't you? You would see yeah. that as you would see that as a yeah, you as, as an aggressive. You'd be like, oh my god, what's it going to like? Is it going to rip the bonnet off, or is it going to, you know, exactly dr- drag yeah. its? Because you know, in horror films, you know, the creature will always drag its claws you know, along the door or the window to, you know, to make that threatening kind of sound or to speak. Maybe it's not threatening or... you. Maybe it's just misunderstood. Maybe it's just misunderstood. Maybe it just wants a cuddle. Misunderstood. Maybe it just... <laughs> just, want, just wants a big cuddle. But it's going to it's gonna be a cuddle that will kill you. That will squeeze so... life out of you. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, but no, I, I thought, that, um, you know, exactly. But I thought that was, um, that was certainly my my kind of favourite. Again, it wasn't the main encounter because it was the May encounter that we discussed that kind of it's, that, it's that the one gave birth to Flatwoods on the map, really, isn't it? It's it, because it, did. Ma- it did. Flatwoods is much like Point Pleasant, really. It's like mm. it has taken this legend as the town's mascot, and like Point mm. Pleasant it has a museum for the Mothman. Flatwoods has a, mo- a museum for the Flatwoods monster, or Oh, it they affectionately call it Braxy. Braxy, they do, yes. They call it Braxy. <laughs> and there's a couple of little chairs dotted around Flatwoods Town. Yeah, it's about five or six. Yeah, the, Braxy monster. Yeah, yeah there's about five or six. They, they bring that up in the Amazon documentary um, that they've done it as a commemorative uh, thing. And they've dotted five or six around the town um, mm. for people to kind of sit in and, and you know. And well, have one being that elementary them. school field with the. Yeah. Where, the boys first, they first saw, saw it. that yeah the 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 ufo yeah but uh, but yeah an- another <laughs> sort of um encounter you know per se which again was also reported to have occurred um you know the night before the may encounter um involved a uh, another crack squad from the west uh, west virginia national guard who were dispatched to what would later become the crash site that, that where the maze would have their encounter um, in a co- covert operation they were under instruction from the united states air force and specifically under the control of a colonel dale levitt or leave it depending on how you want to say it boy leave it leave it leave it <laughs> leave it uh, at, Bur- at Bernie, at burning bush over there we're all the new effect leave it leave it <laughs> the uh the, the squad were there um and then split into two teams to reportedly search for a downed aircraft so again there's a whole p- possible you know cover up or or attempt well, at covering up from, from as the soon government. as the air force gets involved in it yeah well exactly yeah. It, yeah you start to scratch your head thinking well if, if this is nothing and this is just a couple of young kids talking nonsense then why Make it up. Yeah. why would why would the yeah exactly why would the united states air force instigate the national guard to go and investigate on their behalf and you know send a team out to to look for something i mean yeah so yeah so they were there to look for what was reportedly a downed craft now supposedly from their findings um there were indentations in the ground um along with a black liquid that was found to have scorched some of the the grass around the area but okay. seemingly seemingly at that point nothing was was found um, and they, uh, some of the National Guardsmen reported that the area uh, had a smell, a smell of burnt sulphur, um, which again oh. ties into well both the Snatowski and the May um, encounter. That's right. Yeah. Um, and this was, yeah, this was the the day before, so it could have been before the Snatowskis because theirs was at night. Presumably, this would have been during the day, uh, and also the day before the May encounter. So again, it kind of. You know, it kind of ties into that. You know, and as you say, if this was a hoax or if this was nonsense, then why would the United States Air Force, you know, be involved? involved really, why why yeah. would they investigate? Why would they put the money and the resources into, you know, doing it, especially in a small town like Flatwoods? Because presumably you would be able to cover that up quite easily. You can say, oh, well, it's, it's, it's a small, it's a small town. You know, mm. I don't believe them. They're all kooks. They're all country folk. They're all, you know, they're all. You know, yeah, which they're is all, what they're, they're all nuts, and that's what they're trying to say about of, all the little towns in West Virginia, isn't it? Well, it's what a lot, it's, it's what the uh, the government and a lot of the skeptics have, have tried to do. But not only were the United mm-hmm. States Air Force involved, um, mm-hmm. but just going back to um, 
uh, to Kathleen uh, May. Uh, in the years um, in the years that followed her main encounter with her, her sons and, and and the other the other kids, um, she claims to have received a letter addressed from the Pentagon, Ooh. and. Uh, it advised her that what she had seen that night was simply test rockets deployed by the military in some sort of training mission. Um, mm. And so that there was, you know, there was nothing to worry about. What she'd seen was, was, you know, was, was false. This is what it was. Um, now she couldn't remember whether this is just convenient or not. I don't know, but she couldn't remember exactly how the rest of the letter was worded. But she she claims that the end of the letter basically warned her from speaking of the encounter again, and basically told her to not do it. Um, yeah. Now, for I know you will know that you know the reference, but for any listeners that also get the reference, of course, you know things like this cropped up in the Mothman and, of course, many black episodes. Um, and even the injured cold episode, uh, where Woody Derenberger uh, received a visit from the fabled men in black. Um, so again, you know, if this was just a, a hoax, then why would the men in black feel the need to get in touch well, with a, a woman and a group of kids to say, look, this is what you saw, forget about it, and make sure you never talk about it again? Absolutely. You know? Well, the men in black always seem to pose as government officials, whether it be from the, from, the government itself exactly. or from the air force so exactly it's, yeah it's it's not a stretch to imagine that they would send a letter a threatening letter no. although i find it interesting that she, the, the rest of the letter seems vague to her but she remembers yeah. the threat at the, at the very least she remembered the she remembered the threatful nature of the letter but couldn't remember its exact wording um I mean, this interview, I don't know when the interview was conducted with, with her, sadly, uh, but I know, I think it was, um, I think it might have been uh, Ivan Sanderson, who was basically one of the founding fathers of cryptozoology. And I think he interviewed her around, I think it was around 1957, I think. I could be wrong on that, but I'm sure it was around, so it was a, it was a good sort of five years after the encounter. So if she if she just sort of received the letter and thought, oh yeah, okay, I'll never talk about it and kind of threw it in the trash or paid it no mind, then I could believe that after five years, you probably would, unless you had it to hand, you would probably forget the main, the main point. But if you receive yeah. a, a threatening letter from the government, that's probably something that I would not only keep, but I would remember exactly how it was we, again, kind of but worded. This, this, but, this is what I spoke about earlier on in, in, in the episode, that the times were very, very different. Now, because yeah. we don't trust our governments, well, yeah. you and I certainly don't. No, and there's plenty, <laughs> plenty of, there's plenty of them out there that don't either, and there's yeah. plenty of them that are ignorant to it all. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, we don't trust our governments, so we're more likely to hold on to something like that and hold them to account. Yeah, whereas you might need then, it in later life if nothing else. Exactly. Exactly. But back out then, it, it was so much more trusting. Yes. And the governments haven't changed. The governments were exactly the same then as they are now. Yeah. So people just a little bit that more hasn't changed, but it. people were a lot more awake to it. They're a lot yeah. more, um, they're taking notice of what the governments are doing and they're holding them more to, well, at least trying to. Some of them are trying to hold the governments to account. But exactly. Yeah. People back then were just like, yeah, they're, 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 they're for us. Uh, you know, well, you know, the government told trusting. me to not talk about it, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about it, and hmm. and yeah, for so my again, own good. Yeah, and I suppose if they were aware of, because again, it's only a very small town. You know, if if you've got a big crack squad of national guardsmen, you know, with an army colonel turning up to your small town, walking through, you know, the private land and stuff, you know, that's gonna cause a stir so maybe you know yeah knowing, such a little town like you say you know and kathleen was quite prominent in uh in flatwoods um you know she was very well thought of very you know sort of popular and well yeah she was a teacher and a, um i think she was a beauty shop operator or something like that yeah something like yeah something along those lines so she was quite prominent in the in the town so i guess yeah if and for so for her of all people to come out with the encounter or certainly be behind it you know, if 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 it was an attempt at you know a government you know cover up, then she would be the person that they would either visit or or write to. I'm guessing they didn't do a direct visit because again, it was just a town of 200 people, probably not much to be concerned about, and just you know, yeah, we'll send her a letter. That'll probably be enough. You know, they're yeah, they're they're good folk. We don't need to sort of 
you know, threaten them, you know, kind of too much or whatever. Um, but also, again, just to kind of tie in again to, you know, Mothman and that as well, um, the infamous Grey Barker um, of yes. Mothman fame, um, of course, amongst others, um, also visited um, Flatwoods. And he did actually interview... Um, the he witnesses. interviewed the seven, didn't they? Didn't he? he interviewed the, yeah. the the seven witnesses, um, all the, the you know the six kids and um, and Kathleen. Um, I st- have you, yeah, you've that, got some quotes from it, haven't you? Yeah, that well, right? that's what I did. I did find some quotes, and he, he kind of he he throws a spanner into the works with regards to the whole story, really, mm. because he says that. Um, the descriptions, so I'm quoting here, descriptions from the waist down are vague. Most of the seven said that part of the figure was not under view. So mm. whether that's because of the darkness or there was a bush or the mm. foliage or whatever, but not all of them agreed on the anatomy from the waist down. Um, but that's where uh, Kathleen May, she said that it had drape-like folds, yeah. most like a skirt, I guess. Yeah. Um, but then he also said that, so Kathleen, she described that the, 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 the monster had these outstretched arms with terrible claws, mm. but Gray Barker then also says not all agreed that the monster had arms. So not even just the type of arms, just they didn't have they them couldn't at all. agree that yeah. there was arms. Um, it seems like the most prominent thing that they all agreed upon was yeah. the spade shaped head. Yeah. Um. Or a crest, or or yeah. helmet, or, like or whatever it could have been, or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or cow. Yeah. Um. That seems to be the thing that they've all agreed upon. That's the main thing. Yeah. And the which, colours as which well. You, you could, which you could understand, because if if the only source of light is either from Eugene's torch, or you know whatever burning remnants of you know grass and bush that you know that may be kind of going on beneath it. Your your eyesight and the, the 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 light is going to be concentrated on what you're looking at directly in front of you. So if it's only pointing at it's like head and shoulders, then that's all you're going to see. Everything else is going to be plunged into, you know, darkness. And from from what I saw in the documentary, and I know you watched it as well, is that it is fairly until it opens until it opens up at the bottom of the ridge slightly, it is fairly dense, you know, sort of woodland. So there is a chance yeah. that it could have been covered up by stuff and it would obscure your view and. And like you say, if you're a ten-year-old kid and you're seeing an alien for the first time, you're not going to think to look down to think, "Oh, has it got feet? Has it got legs?" Or exactly, you know, yeah, you're just going like to hightail it out of there, and you're just going to think, "No, no, off your pop, mate, <laughs> and, uh, See you later. and and run," which is, you know, of course, sort of what they did. So yeah, he does try to, he does try to. I think, he, he, I think he's being honest there. I think he's being honest with uh, by with, yeah. with with those quotes in particular because oh, he is, yeah. Well, we've already discussed it, you know, that the, there is this, they're kids and their kids yeah. tend to exaggerate things. They don't maybe yeah. not get all the stories correct. They might see things that others don't. Mm. Um, that's just general people, not just kids. But uh, what yeah. I found, what I found interesting with regards to the research and everything is all the other ways that people try to explain this as well. Yeah. So one of the most uh, famous ones is, um, I don't say most famous, one of the most prominent debunk of this was that, it was a barn owl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, which, that seems to be the main skeptics' kind of fallback to which was to the also, it. which was also the the similar sort of thing for Mothman in the same yes, area. It was. It was, Ooh, yeah. it was a large mutated crane, or it was a large mutated owl. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, and they'd, I mean, they tried to, you know, the 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 one that does come up with this was that okay, well, everyone knows what a barn owl looks like, but. Sometimes the females mm. have a reddish hue to their face, and they are yeah, actually larger than, than the males. They are. Um, however, the, the again the size of them they're a little mm. over a foot in like in height. Mm. Um, they have a, like a a spade shaped head, but it's inverted to what yeah to what the their pictures have been on yeah. this. So, and I know that yeah. owls can move their heads in certain ways, but there's no way it's going to be looking at you upside down and flying towards you. You know, the head isn't going to be inverted. No, exactly. Um, I'd, and uh, they're saying that the, the the coloration difference was that there was a bush directly underneath it. Now, that's right. I can yeah. understand where right. this theory has come from because 
in the original story, the, in the original account, when they first notice the eyes, it's within an oak tree. That's right. Now, barn owls are, they don't nest. They, they find empty spaces. Mm. That's why they often nest within barns. Yeah. So oak trees are also known to hollow out. Mm. So this is where the, the theory does come from, really. So mm. they say, okay, well, it's an oak tree. Barn owls often nest within oak trees. Therefore, it was a, a female protecting her young. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't know how plausible that is as a, as 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 a, an explanation for it because, especially when you take into account the picture that um, Eugene Lemon and Kathleen May are standing next to, yeah. and it shows the monster for scale. Yeah, as well. Uh, that's the thing for me. It's you know. I mean, yes, these are young kids. They're, you know, 10, 12 and, you know, 13 years old or whatever, around that sort of age. But they're living in a small town surrounded by a vast woodland in the foothills of, you know, mountains. Barn owls are synonymous with that area. Mm. They're going to know what an owl looks like. And yeah. when, when Eugene shines, you know, the, the torch on it, even if you look at it for a few seconds, at some point you're going to be like, that's a barn owl. Oh, I know what that is. That's a that's a barn. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, there's nothing to sure. worry about. And then you just carry on with looking, or if you think, oh, it wasn't a meteor, it was just a fucking owl or something, and you'd be like, okay, fine. And the fact that he's in the National Guard as well, he's going to have been used to being out and about amongst the woodland, you know, going on hikes, go, you know. You would have thought so. And there's also a woman who, I mean, I didn't, I don't actually know her age, but you've got to assume that she's going to be maybe in her forties. Like she didn't seem that she Possibly, sound like she yeah. was particularly daft. So she's also, again, going to know what an owl looks like. And I just think that that's the typical cop-out, I think, for yeah. a lot of these debunkers, which, I mean, I'm I'm calling bullshit on the debunk. I don't – there's absolutely no way that they would have mistaken yeah. what they described as a, a barn owl. I mean, if it had, like, a similar-shaped face, it had they described it having wings and it had glowing red eyes and whatever, then you'd be like mm. – Okay, yeah, all right. Maybe I could see where the confusion would come from. But when you see, when you hear the description from the May brothers, and you see the picture that you just referenced that Kathleen and Eugene are standing with, if you truly saw that, there is no way you're mistaking that for anything other than what exactly. it is. There's just no way. I don't care how daft you are or or what, no, how young you it, are. You know what a bird looks like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like you say, they grew up around that area. They know. They know the woodland they know the creatures yeah. they know the critters and everything and like you say you shine your flashlight got it oh there's a bar now i mean i've That's not even it. seen that many i mean the only the only owls i've ever seen are either in farms or local zoos or whatever so it's not like i've seen yeah. one in the wild but i've seen one up close enough to know that if i did see one well, in a woodland where i am out here out, out yeah, in great wakering yeah, I've, likely, I've seen but... i've seen owls in flight yeah I haven't heard them because they're bloody they're silent. But yeah. I've seen it shoot past, and, and then my mind instantly went, "That must have been an owl." Yeah, it, 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 I didn't go. Well, fucking hell, it's Mothman. It's Mothman. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. you know, it's, That's the flat I didn't do that. There, right? Yeah, I might want to believe, but yeah. I'm not going to jump to that conclusion straight away. Exactly. Yeah, but, you have that rational part of your mind, which I'm sure exactly. She would, as as you know, a woman of her age, you know, yeah. also being a mother as well. You're not you're not going to just want to throw your kids into being scared of something that isn't there because it's not like she's mm. got prior, you know, she's got prior UFO stories or she's really trying to push the whole UFO thing or anything like that. This was seemingly the first, you know, the first thing. So, yeah, like you say, that's the main encounter. Or, sorry, not the main encounter. The main reason for. Trying the to main exp explanation, it wasn't it? And and, yeah, but if you but if you think account, if you think if you think that one is bollocks, right? <laughs> you're gonna love this one, right? <laughs> it is another creature. It is oh, another. It God. is a, a creature that does exist. Yeah. Um, there's some oh. people that are trying to attribute it to a giant salamander. Yes, you're right. A salamander. Yeah, a I salamander. Yeah, I you did hear me correct. Yeah. a giant salamander. Which I mean, there's only on. three species across the world, right? Yeah. Um, there's the most famous one is the giant uh, Chinese cave salamander, mm. and they they have found specimens in 
around that area as well. So around right. the Appalachian Mountains and, and such. But what some people are trying to say is it's a salamander that's climbing up a tree. Now they're saying, okay, well, this would actually explain the spade shaped head that they saw. It would, um, it would it'd explain the, the two eyes in the center of it. It would also explain the red coloration as well, because it would. Yeah. some, well, they're, they're slightly red. I'd say they're more orange based on pictures that I've seen, but it doesn't explain the quick movement and the hissing. So it doesn't explain the, no. the thing dropping from the tree. It doesn't explain it coming mm. toward them. It doesn't explain no. the hissing either. And also, although the hissing weird as salamanders are, you wouldn't yeah. go, "Oh that's my god, that's a monster. giant! That's a ten foot monster!" Because they certainly don't grow to that sort of size. No tops of like four, maybe five feet. I think. Yeah, it's kind of like Komodo dragon, sort of size. For, oh, for, for reference, it's huge. It's, you know, but again, you would know that it was a lizard because they've got features that you would recognize. And again, if it's a creature that's popular in that area or has certainly been sighted, again, you would you well, would see that and you would think you wouldn't look at a salamander or climbing up a tree and think, oh, that's a ten foot mechanical alien. Well, I suppose uh, the thing is though that these salamanders are they are rare. They are rare. That's the thing. They they which also doesn't you know that helps to debunk the debunking so to speak that they are so incredibly rare that what is the possibility that this very very rare creature stumbled out of a cave which is not something that they often do they they tend to stay within the caves Mm. they're an amphibian they're not going to go wandering on the land for too long because they need to be within they don't have to no yeah so like you say i think it's it's almost like clutching at straws for it is. general skeptics people that are just like exactly i'm just yeah. skeptical as per my nature which is fine you can be it's yeah. absolutely fine Whatever, yeah. we joke we joke about wanting to to believe yeah. and all that but exactly, yeah we at least try and add some sort of skeptical behavior to, to these investigations yeah. but exactly I and think... if it was anything else then i could have been like yeah okay like i get that like if i don't know like if they say that, I don't know, bears are pr- quite prominent in that area and it could have just been a bear on its hind legs and they would, you know, or, you know, something like that, then you could be like, okay, well, the size, the mm. stature, all of that kind of adds up, the shape of the head, not so much, but there are other bits that you could add to it. But the fact that barn owls have come up in so many other cryptids as a way of debunking it and explaining it as something else, mm. it starts to get to the point where I'm like, Come on, you've used that one already. Like, well, there is a there is a weird little connection with owls and UFO ta- uh, UFO activity. So there is it's, yeah. there's um, there's a lot of owl uh, referencing and imaging yeah. with regards to screen memories or potential screen memories because yeah. what they what people remember is oval shaped dark yeah. eyes, oval uh, heart shaped head. Yeah. Um. What you know that there was a load of owls in my bedroom. Yeah. Last night, whereas that's their mind possibly recreating um, recreating what actually happened, and it's what, just yeah. it, 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 these the alien greys walking around in their bedroom, and their mind goes, "What the fucking hell is that?" Right. Let's switch it to something that we know about. They go to the closest thing that their mind can comprehend, and more yeah, from so, that, it seems to be the owl. So, so owls yeah. do crop up with regards to UFO and supposed alien activity. They do, yeah, but not as a way just, of debunking it, though. It's normally as a reason why you've seen it, or because yeah. I've also read that you know owls are seen as kind of messengers, or you know it's, well, it's kind of like, like you know when spiritual people, sort of thing. Yeah, so like you know when people see, I don't know, there's that whole thing where you, you know if you see one bird, it means something. If you see two of the same bird, it means oh, the magpies else. and such. Yeah, yeah. There's a similar thing with owls and. Yeah, spiritual behavior and you know UFOs and stuff. And yeah, and that kind of thing. Like, so if you see, you know, one hour it means something. If you see two, it means something else. Three, it means this, oh, okay. and so on. So I, I didn't go too much into it because I didn't think it was overly necessary for for kind of for this one. But so that it, it, but owls are tend to you tend to be used as a a support method to a lot of this as opposed to a debunking. Mm. I just find that. It's just kind of a throwaway comment where, like, a scientist or a skeptic will just be like, "Oh, yeah, no, it was a barn owl. They're known to be in that area, so that's all it was." Yeah. And you think, 
Well, no, that's just I, anyone. I mean, I'm anyone with an inquisitive that. mind goes. Well, I'm not buying. I'm that. calling yeah, bullshit like on that. Anyone I, with I'm an inquisitive mind that. will just go. Yeah. That's a bit too simplistic of a of an answer for that one, mate. I think you might want to yeah. have another look at it. I mean, we you already know, know that there's a government cover up, supposedly with the National Guard and the United States Air Force. You know, yeah. um, investigating the area. You know, only the day before, so something must have been going on for them to you know, to kind of warrant that, you know, you've then got the communications in the years following, you know, supposedly from the Pentagon, you know, slash men in black. Again, they wouldn't make themselves know, although they didn't address it, you know, from the men in black, but the the threatening, the threatening nature of the letter and the fact that it came from a government body almost certainly points to it being, you know, them. And so again, why would they feel the need to get in, in touch <clears throat> if it was just a nonsense or if they feel if they thought that they could play it out as kind of being just a woman and some kids seeing something and making a story, they could have just left it as that. But it's almost yeah. like their involvement inadvertently adds credence to it in that respect. It does. It does. I've, I've, I think you're right there. I mean, we've said it on previous episodes. We've, we've made exactly the same point on previous episodes. Yeah. For me, this this particular story i've seen so much in the way of debunking yeah and it's it's hard for that not to necessarily not it's, it's hard not to turn you onto that side of the fence as well yeah exactly but yeah not what we discussed earlier on in the week the one thing that does keep bringing me back and we referenced this in an earlier episode mm. we have we've referenced this in our men in black episode right um and we also referenced the Flatwoods Monster in that episode. Yeah. And it was yeah, the description up, yeah. that Albert K. Bender gave of mm. these creatures, their true form. Mm. And he says that he remembers seeing a red face with green body standing 10 foot tall. Mm. So uh, this is the thing. If it was utter bollocks and his story his encounters started happening in 1953. Mm. So a year later. Yeah, that's right. Um, I believe it was actually August was the, the first one where yeah. he was sitting in the theatre. It was August mm. of, of 53. Mm. And he didn't write the book until nine years later. So has he seen this? Has, has Bender seen this description and gone, I'm going to run with that? Or has he actually seen something that's very similar to that? Yeah. And it's just, and I've never seen anyone make this connection before. No, that is, I think that is pretty much the only sort of connection. I guess for anyone that's not following, what we're sort of essentially mm. saying is that the description of the Flatwoods monster is also the description that Albert Bender gave as the true form of the men in black. So is... The ones that he interacted with. The one that the he interacted least. with, the, the species, of, you know, that he interacted with. So is it possible that the Snatowskis, you know, the Mays and Albert Bender actually came into contact with the men in black in their true form before yeah. they decided to take on the humanoid, you know, sort of disguise. Well, it, it, Bender does say that they were here on Earth for a particular reason, and that was to mm. refine the seawater. Yeah. Um, that's right. And we went into the details on that. So it'll be yeah. worth, if you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to our Men in Black episode because we do go into the details, mm. brief details at the very least, as to why those creatures were here on Earth. Yeah. Um, and they subsequently have left Earth. Yeah. Um, so-, yeah so it kind of ties ties it all sort of back in again. Um, but again, just going with the, you know, back to the sort of the debunking, as I mentioned earlier, I watched that the... Uh, good old monster quest um, yeah. the particular episode um that i watched was uh episode seven of season one um which was i think i think it's titled the lizard man but basically they look into the the flatwoods yeah monster um now the main guy that i that i could still remember from it was a uh, he's a I, th- I think he's a paranormal investigator his name's joe nickel um yes. and he He's quite prominent in in this kind of field. And he wrote that book about um, X Files or, or something like yeah, that, didn't it? The real so. story of the X Files. Yeah. Um, and he basically goes there. He doesn't. He doesn't really believe in the encounter. So his main purpose is to try and, you know, sort of debunk it. And I think that that's where I, you know, sort of also heard the the whole owl thing as a possible, um, as a possible debunk. 
Now, yeah. what they do, because obviously you mentioned the oak tree earlier, and what they do is they actually test what is left of that oak tree um, that's been standing for about 100 years. Now, there isn't much left of it because it actually rotted and died, f- supposedly following the encounter um, with the Flatwoods oh, monster. Yeah, so Joe Nicol and this team basically test the bark and the soil around it to see whether they can pick up any traces of any kind of either like unearthly element or any high traces of a particular chemical that could tie into what the maze, you know, said they saw with like the sulfuric, uh, sulfuric smell, the, you know, the, the, the smoke or the sort of fog on the ground, because there would have been traces left behind. And if the tree was killed because of that, it would also be within the bark. Um, Yeah. Now they, they obviously they carried out these tests as a way to sort of try and debunk it, and and yeah, they couldn't find any traces of anything kind of unusual or anything that they wouldn't expect to find. The the soil mm. had been disturbed, um, but there wasn't any kind of acidity to it, or you know, or anything like that. Hadn't been um, changed. It hadn't really been sort of changed. He said there was a few chemicals, you know, in there, but again, with the underground cave systems and the type of you know. You know animals and and uh, agricultural work that goes on because uh, I think that they found like petrol I think or or some sort of um, uh, like yeah yes. like something of that kind of nature I don't know if it was necessarily diesel but it was something of that you know family oh okay so chemicals. some sort of combustible fuel yeah but yeah that's it that's what I'm trying to think um, think the word of um, so yeah so that that was one thing they did his main thing and I know we've brought this up before in the previous episode which was quite a (laughs) contentious point but he also came up with what his main theory is to kind of debunk what the maze saw on that night and it was something that he referred to as expectant attention um, yes which is basically if you think you're if you go into something thinking that you're going to see something in particular then that's going to affect what you see. So yeah. I think what he's trying to say is that if they looked at what they saw flying through the sky and said, that's a UFO, then mm. they went to investigate. What he's saying is that he, they would have kind of almost tricked their own mind into believing that whatever it is, is a UFO. Yeah. Sort of thing. If you're going to go looking for a monster, you're going to find You're going to find one. Exactly that. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. That's kind of what he's pinning his whole kind of theory on. Um, it's kind of what people do on Twitter, isn't it? <laughs> it's kind of what they do on Twitter. Isn't go it? looking yeah. for trouble and you'll find it. Yeah. Yeah. Go go looking for racists and you'll find and them. You'll find them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I know we, because I know that came up in the episode, what was it? The Men in Black episode, was it with the. The science experiment that the lady did with Disney World. Yes, and the, and the sev- the participants where she told them a year later that they had gone to Disney World, and it kind of fabricated a memory that they didn't actually have. I think it's along the same sort of lines that was, as that. I think that was Mothman. We was that the Mothman that one? Was it? I couldn't I think it remember. Was, yeah. I know, but yeah, I knew it was. Um, it was along those. It, it's a different. It's a different theory, but it's very much along the same sort of lines. Um, no, I I don't. I don't believe that, you know, myself. I, I, mean, I've, I do I've, think there is, I there do think there is to it, a but... certain part to it that, because it's definitely, I think it's, a, I think it is a strong theory with regards to a lot of things because people do only see what they want to see. We all know that. Oh yeah. Um, you know, they, they do try and. This, though, I'm not, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Cause you know, people will only see what they want to see. They'll only hear what they want to hear and they will fabricate whatever in their mind to fit mm. their narrative i get that do i buy it specifically in this situation probably not so much okay it's probably not so much i don't know i mean yeah they're te- you know they're 10 years old they're impressionable eugene could have shouted something it's that whole um that group mentality thing that, that we that we've also covered before um mm. where one person says they saw something and everyone else yeah, everyone else joins, goes, jumps, yeah, on, yeah, jumps on the back of it. Yeah, all. yeah, no, that's what I saw as well. You know, which is probably why when Gray Barker interviewed them, their descriptions were kind of vague at points. Well, so, yeah, I mean, so there's I, a little me, bit. There's a sliver. For me, the reason why that that does kind of, I guess, what I suppose we're kind of getting off the fence a little bit here, aren't we? I think we're we're, we're certainly to that point. 
we've you certainly know, given we've certainly offered up all of the possible or, or yeah. potential kind of debunks that that people have that people have tried so i think so, it's worthwhile us getting off the fence now i think we've both kind of landed firmly on what side of the fence we're on but did you want to yeah did you want to just I, kind of this is the thing right i'm i'm still I'm still kind of on the fence with it, but obviously I have to come off one side or the other. And I am teetering. I am teetering, to be honest, that I don't really believe it. Right. Okay. I don't really believe it. Um, Interesting. This is the only thing that really does keep me on the fence. So the only thing that is just making me keep, I keep peeking over and just Mm. is the Albert K. Bender connection. That's the only thing that's, Really, right. kind of, which probably me isn't on there. really that compelling, which, really. Out of which all... isn't no, but it's yeah. it's a connection to something. That yeah. Okay. No one else seems to have made that connection to, and if if yeah. they have, then yeah, please correct me. I've not heard but, it. I must admit, I did listen to a fair few podcasts about it, and no one else yeah. brought up that connection. But then I don't know whether they did Men in Black episodes, so that could be yeah. the that could be the reason why. But no, okay. Well, that's but for me, yeah, I'm. I'm I, if I am going to have to come off the fence at this yeah. point in time, I will yeah. say that I don't a hundred percent believe it. I'm probably right, okay. something along the lines of 80% not believing it. Um, and right, it's, okay. it, it's, it's because of the witness testimonies, really the, the, the seven, the initial seven yeah. that it's, I remember at that age, like, like from like ten, about ten, ten years old is the youngest one, Ronnie Schaefer, mm. and I remember at ten years old telling a story about seeing a werewolf. Right, right. utter bollocks, mate, utter bollocks. I wasn't even in the woods at night, but I remember telling everyone at school that I'd seen a werewolf. He'd seen a werewolf. It was utter bollocks, right, okay. you know. So, yeah. and I, I, but that's for me on a personal sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I had that tendency as a child. Yeah. To exaggerate or even just. Straight up make up seeing a werewolf yeah. in the in the, in the woods. I mean, you know, yeah. and it for me it's yeah. the is the they can't necessarily um agree upon a description of it. They can't necessarily yeah, I mean, agree upon yeah. the the events like um like Neil Nunley, he said that when they saw the monster. Yeah, over to the right, about fifty feet to the right, was um, a, a ball of fire landed, but none of the other six mentioned the ball of fire that was fifty feet to the right. It's, right. Okay. It also wasn't. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't noted in the newspaper articles the the next day. Yeah. Um. It's so yeah. It's. Okay. I don't get I don't I don't buy owls and salamanders. No. I don't no, buy no. that. No, no. Um I do would buy you, do you know what you have you had a thought about what you would attribute it to if it's not either of those theories? I, I suppose you'd be going down the more Joe Nickel route then, wouldn't you, about the whole um, yeah. uh expectant attention theory. Yeah. Kind that's, of if you go there looking much... for something, then you're gonna find it, sort of thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. That is that yeah. that's that seems to be that for me seems to be the most plausible yeah. explanation. I I don't think I don't think they've made it up to a degree. I think mm. they it is a misidentification of, of something. something. Right. I don't buy that it was a misidentification of an owl. I don't de- yeah. definitely don't buy that it was a giant salamander. Yeah. That uh, it they just seem to be throwaway. I just can't explain it. Right. I can't explain what they saw. And I don't think that their their You stories... can't explain it, but you know you don't believe it, essentially. I'm yeah, I'm I'm just skeptical okay. of of the collective accounts of it. Yeah. As okay. well. You know, that the one thing that they do all seem to agree upon is the shape of the head and yeah. the colours. So the okay. red round face with the, yeah. the ace of spades behind it and then green body. Yeah. They can't all agree upon that they that it had arms, mm. um, and they can't all necessarily agree on like the way well from the head down. Really, um, it's yeah, and I know that Ed and Fred are 
adamant yeah. about what they saw and that they've they been able to develop their own their own theories and i do believe having seen like the the interviews with them yeah they do seem truthful so i don't think it's yeah. a hoax i don't no. i don't think it's a hoax but i i yeah. i I think it is a misidentification of something. Of something, yeah. We just don't know what that thing is necessarily. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. I've, okay. I've, I've <laughs> think quite. I think I surprised you there because um, I'm so willing yeah. to believe. Yeah, I don't in, think in you'd a be lot so of cases. far on that side of the fence. I thought you'd maybe be maybe leaning a little bit more towards believing it, but you know, you'd have your reservations. So, yeah, I didn't necessarily expect you to. You know, to if be I on the to, if other I have side. to jump off the fence today, right now at this moment, then, that's the side you're jumping on. Yeah, that would yeah. be what I'd have to go on. I'm, it's not the hill I'm going to die on because there might be something no. that pops up later on down the line and, that makes yeah. me go, "Oh, hang on a second, I'm going to go this, over." I, this I, changes I think things. I'm, yeah, yeah, the grass okay. is greener on that side. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. Right. So yeah, I, yeah, I, I've got to say, I, I was surprised with with where you landed um with that one i wasn't sure i mean i wasn't sure where obviously we never really know until we start getting into it but i thought you might have been like i say leaning more onto the side of kind of believing it but having a few reservations but but no, it's interesting yeah. that you've gone on that side because i mean i'm pretty sure i've made it quite clear that what <laughs> no, i'm on the it. i'm on the other <laughs> side of the fence <laughs> I, I do. This doesn't happen like this. No, this, <laughs> I think this might be the historically, first. Historically, we're yeah. the other side of the fence. Yeah, on this. this might be the first, but um, I, I'm more inclined to believe it. And again, it's it's for a few reasons. I mean, I, I agree with your point that you know kids do make stuff up. They have got vivid imaginations and they can let it run wild. But I think even to this extent, it's still quite a job, and it would take quite an imagination to come up with you know, to come up with this stuff and to come up with, with what they, with what they created, you know, the fact that you've got the, I mean, he's still a 17 year old lad, but you've got Eugene Lemon, who, you know, is a national guardsman. He would be able to identify creatures as, you know, as much as the mother would. So I agree with you that I don't believe that it can be easily debunked with either being a barn owl or a giant salamander. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I'm not on the side of the fence, you know, with that, I do agree with you there. Um, I just think the other accounts do add credibility because aside from the actual monster's description, all the other sort of eventualities do add up and, you know, and there are, there are links. Um, you know, you've got the involvement from the United States Air Force, you know, you've got the uh, West Virginia National Guard that are obviously that have been deployed on their behalf. You've got the supposed communication from the men in black, which we know holds a lot of weight in previous episodes that we've, you know, that we've covered. Um, the fact that the mother was there, um, I think if it was just the kids, um, and like it was the exact same encounter, but it was just the children on their own, then I think I'd be more inclined to side with you possibly. But I think yeah. with Kathleen being there and the fact that she went to the effort of joining them and the fact that they specifically ran home to tell her about it and she still went out with them, whether she was humoring them or not, I don't know, but I think her being there and the prominent figure that she was within Flatwoods, how well liked she was, how popular she was, you know, I think to go along with something like that would have been quite a lot, you know, and yeah. like with Woody Derenberger, you know, like Albert Bender, they didn't necessarily have a reason to come out with this story, you know, or to give details of this encounter. They could have quite easily just plot got on with their lives quite happily and not brought any of this seemingly unwanted attention you know on their doorstep um mm. because like with any fame it, it has brought a lot of unwanted attention pretty sure that's not hopefully what kathleen experienced in real life but i don't know i just think there's the similarities between the encounters there's the involvement of the government the men in black there's the fact the mother was involved and gave an account she went on national telly with her nephew eugene um you know i think there's a lot a lot more of this encounter for me that kind of adds adds cred credibility to it and allows me to kind of sit quite comfortably on that on that side of the fence you know we've also gone over other references with with other episodes mm. that we've done that kind of draw comparisons or similarities from from you know the mothman encounters or you know the many black interactions so you know th there's a lot of what you know you could see it as coincidences I don't necessarily believe in coincidences, but there are certainly yeah. similarities 
and 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 that th- th- I think do hold you know credence to this. You know, don't get me wrong. There are things about it that my skeptical mind do kind of hold mm-hmm. on to. The fact that one of the May brothers in the documentary actually says, you know, I don't care whether people believe me or not, as long as Flatwoods is on the map. Yeah. Now, to me, I kind of thought, so is this all bollocks and you've just done it to put Flatwoods on the map to kind of draw tourism or to kind of bring income to the town because you were well struggling or something? I thought maybe, that, so that's maybe, kind they're of in, my... maybe they're in rivalry with Point Pleasant. With Point Pleasant. <laughs> yeah. They've got it's their own that, festival, it's not mate. That far away, and they've got their whole <laughs> festival for it. So, yeah, but no, honestly, like, joking aside, that was a consideration. I did think, well, it, have they just have they just done that for you know that purpose? But like I said to you during That's the week right, when too. we when we spoke about it, I I I found the May brothers to be genuine. I didn't get the impression like when oh, you yeah. when you, listen, when you watch you know like Frank Strange's or you listen to him or whatever. You could tell that he just wasn't. He was. He was full of it. Like yeah, we, we got off the fence on that one really, pretty badly. damn quick. Yeah. Whereas with this yeah. one, like I say, I, I I believe that it that it happened. I think there's a lot of a lot of the debunks. I think on this one, some of them they do hold a bit of credence, but I think on this one it is clutching at straws, and they are just trying to debunk it for the sake of debunking it instead of actually believing in the possibility, because they are so weak. You know, the mm. evidence. No one's actually really come forward with anything concrete to say it wasn't that it was this and i've got a photo yeah. of it or you know because there, i mean there was a farmer on separate land about three miles from flatwoods who described seeing the same ball of light and the same flashing from the ground as oh, what absolutely the, as what the may brothers claim to have seen much like with again woody derenberger there are other people that drove on that same freeway that came forward and reported seeing you know, seeing flashing lights, seeing a car stop, talking to a man at the side of the road. You know, so there are there are other. Well, it witness- was it, it was um, there the were meteors recorded by the Maryland Academy of Science, and along with a lot of were. Uh, local yeah, newspapers, in, um, Ohio meteor sightings and activity of yeah. for that for that evening for that same evening. Yeah, but, but so that's there the were thing lights they've... in the sky that were shooting about. So they've and... confirmed that there were meteor showers over that that area mm. i think in specifically to flatwoods it was over i think ohio pennsylvania and virginia which i think are all kind of neighboring states of yeah. uh, of west virginia well, so that's that's yeah. kind of why i'm on this side of the fence really it's like the the you've you know you've alluded to it already about what one of the the, the may brothers said he like as long as flatwoods is on the map i want to believe it like I've said many times already <laughs> i could tell i can tell really you want do. to believe it i really do want to believe, believe it, it but but it's there's just there's just too much that doesn't quite add up for me. I think it does you know? that does say a lot though. I think because normally because I'm prior to us kind of doing this sort of thing, I would have been more of the skeptic than you, which yeah. is why you say that these roles are, are now sort of reversed. So I think for you to sit there being more of the believer and th- not necessarily skeptical. believing and actually being skeptical, I think does kind yeah. of say a lot about well, the encounter but it also says a lot for me to say that i believe it because normally i'd be the one being like nah it's rubbish because yeah well i'm, I'm well, things, Z, things but... that i'm taking into account with this as well is that the ufo became very much part of pop culture you know mm. there, at that time there was huge ufo mm. flaps across um the stage which i do believe was a real thing i very much do believe there was ufos was being thing, seen because yeah. well, they the were unidentified yeah. they were flying they were objects yeah. and but it was it was finding its way into popular culture there was films being produced there were, there were. tv shows radio shows all comics. about alien activity comic comics books as well yeah there was novels coming out and everything so yeah. the idea of like these the I this, this one in particular wasn't a little green man it was a Giant, green, giant man, green man, yeah. Um, roaming around the American uh, land, looking mm. for victims well, and yeah. stuff, it became it became part of popular culture. And as as children, you look to see what all the adults are looking at as well, mm. and you try and get involved in it. So, like I remember, yeah. like when we were growing up, it was all the, the slasher films and horror films that were, yeah. That was coming out all like the freddy mm. krueger's and the jason Voorhees right. films yeah. and such and we we wanted to be so 
<laughs> Those ones. <laughs> Who's that? Oh, it's just the wind. Michael? <laughs> <laughs> and... It's like, I, I remember talking about those sort of things with the kids on the playground and saying, oh, yeah, I saw this film, I saw that film, blah, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And like I said, making I up stories too. about seeing yeah. a werewolf and, and, and stuff like this. And Yeah, I get that as well. I think I just remember being one of the, one of those kids, you yeah. know, that just made shit up, um, I guess, because it was funny. <laughs> Didn't we all? Didn't but... we all? Yeah. I, just, I, just, I mean, there's a difference between making shit up and then there's describing this encounter i mean I, I can i can give a certain amount of leeway to the you know the vagueness in the descriptions because there were there are other quite vivid encounters where the descriptions of the creature itself are also quite vague or not particularly yeah. detailed so the fact that all seven of them have pretty much said the same thing in terms of the upper portion of what they saw its head at the very least yeah head and shoulders pretty much is what they've all confirmed and kind of all been on the same page with it's just everything else that would have been outside the line of you know the, the the sort of the torchlight or their sight. Um, you know, I, I I didn't know. I mean, I don't know whether you know what time of year, what the time of year is like over in the states around this sort of time. So I don't know whether it would have been dark mm. at that point or whether it would have been dusk. I know in the reenactment in the it's documentary so- they give the impression that it was pretty dark and that the only light they had was either from the moonlight or their torchlight. Yeah, I think it was. Um, I think it was getting to dusk when they were playing on the field. But so by right, the time so- they run home, got mum. Headed so yeah, so it could have been sort of to go trespass on matey's land and on matey's land, scale yeah. fences and everything. Yeah, exactly. So it probably um, would have been, it would have yeah. been not nightfall but, by that um, point. But yeah, so I mean, I, I do. Yeah, I, I have sort of for the most part, sort of, and I know you have as well. It's kind of debunked the debunking, which yeah. which then doesn't leave any, doesn't offer up any other real other possibilities other than what they saw um you know especially when you've got the young the uh, Satowskis that saw it you know and you've got a few few others as well so yeah I don't know I'd I'd, I think if I didn't have to make a decision decision I'd probably still be on the fence but I'd be leaning more towards believing it I guess at this point but if I've got to make a whole getting off the fence is to get off the fence to get off it so for that reason (laughs) it'd be a cop out to say now I'm going to stick right here thank you very much almost two hours I'm on the fence (laughs) Um, but no I yeah I I would say that I'd be the opposite and I'd be more kind of jumping into the believing camp um, just based off of everything that we've sort of discussed but um, but yeah I mean that's that's sort of that's it from us and you know as always guys you know if you've if you've got any thoughts and theories on this if you've got any ideas as to what you believe happened and what the maze saw that night then yeah please do get, in sort of get involved yeah absolutely get in touch. yeah got... so thank you very much for listening yeah um, as always we've got i always get involved i always get involved tell us what you think of this um whether you're on my side of the fence or you're on Callum's side of the fence come tell us are you team uh, Scott or team we, Callum we do like a conflict let us know we do like yeah. a conflict every now and then yeah team <laughs> Scott or team Callum let us know um, so yeah you can find us on uh, Facebook you can find us on Instagram on YouTube and uh, we've yep. got we'll add uh, a link for the Discord as well yep we'll start come adding join that us well. on that yeah um, we'll start getting links and pictures and other bits and pieces on there as well uh, we're not as active on there as maybe we should um, maybe we we'll, we should actually yeah, start we'll getting start, on the Discord yeah. and start posting some of the stuff that we've been looking yeah. at. Yeah, no, we, we should really do that. Let's be mm-hmm. honest. Yeah, no, we should. Um, so that okay. leaves us to announce next episode. Yes, it so does. Our yes. next episode. <laughs> I'm excited is, for this one. Yeah, this is this is like creep level one hundred. Yeah, um, we're going to look at the black eyed children. I hope you've enjoyed this one, and uh, hope to. Um, Hope to see you around for the next. See you soon. Yeah, see you guys.